Hey, fellas, just to let you know, I tested the Ethernet cable connection and it buffered, but the buffering was much less and for a shorter time. Did you guys know that? Just want you to know that. And hey, hey Rad, I went and I changed the DNS. I don't know if he's here. I, I, think, he, I think he was. He was here earlier. Radical moderate. I changed the DNS. What's interesting is it didn't show any DNS of its own. And I pressed apply, but I don't know what happened from there. Folks, right now, I'm connected to the modem. Uh, the modem router came with an Ethernet cable. I connected it to the modem. I'm now connected to the modem. That's why I changed my location. I'm now by the modem, and the download speed was over 300, and the upload speed was over 30. Okay? So now what I need to get next is a, a lamp because there's no light here. But I tried it earlier, and it's still buffered, but not as bad. So I'm scared. But if Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God, my Savior, my love, our God, our Lord, our love, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the Father's very heart, if he's pleased to use me to glorify his name by the power of the Spirit, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and bless you, then everything good is from him. Everything perfect is from him as a gift of his grace. So he'll bless the connection. In Jesus' name, we trust in the Lord Jesus, right? You can get the most sophisticated system and equipment and the most brilliant computer guys. And still, if Jesus Christ is not blessing it, he wants to shut it down, no one can stop him. Luisa Campbell. Yes, I saw that. All right. How you doing, Abdul Halaj? How you doing, Andrew? Oh, by the way, let me give you this link, uh, this link again. This is for all you apologists to Muslims. I just posted this two days ago. Did you know Muhammad had a white devil following him around? Oh, you remember that, Andrew Martin? You guys missed it. Early in the morning, when I first woke up, I did a test, and the buffering was terrible. It was bad. It almost made me want to throw myself off the balcony. But what we did was we didn't teach. I, dan I was dancing. I was singing. I was jumping up and down. We had a blast. Too bad I had to delete it. I was singing even Indian songs. And I was doing the Indian version of Karate Kid. Karate Kid. Karate Kid. Karate Kid. Karate Kid. What did the problem make? Lord willing, I'll do a session. Just having fun with you guys. Yeah, Rad, if you were, I guess you were not here. You were away. I changed it. I changed it to Google DNS. So and I, I pressed OK and apply. So let's see. And now, Rad, I just connected to the modem router. It's right here. That's why I'm in a different location, right? Different location. And I used the Ethernet cable that came with the modem router, just like Lisa said. God bless you guys. So let's trust and see what the Lord Jesus will do. Because if it's now good, that's it. I'm ready to go. Now I just need a lamp because the lighting here is not that good. Okay. Amen. The trying God be glorified. Uh, well, the problem is the motor router. The, you know how the, you have to connect it to the wall? You know what I'm talking about, right? This is the only place this apartment has it. It was only here. All right. This is only, it was only here. So I'm, I'm expecting it to buffer. Yeah, I don't know because the apartment complex, you have to get permission from them. It's not so much what they can do because they already have it on the wall here. You got to get permission to drill it somewhere else. Right? I had to run here because now I'm connected to the router directly with the Ethernet cable that I threatened to block people for. And I changed the DNS. Thank the Lord Jesus for radical moderate, for Protestant believer, for first last, and all of you. All of you who gave me the advice, God bless you. The Father bless you. The Lord Jesus bless you. The Holy Spirit bless you, right? Because you guys are blessing. You're trying to help me to help the rest of you by making the internet connection the best possible 
so that the Holy Spirit continues to use me by his power and might to glorify Jesus and bless you, the church. So thank you, guys. You know, thank you. And it's helping me to learn because, folks, I'm the youngest of six. And I was pampered because I had two older sisters. God bless you. Thank you for your support. Lord Jesus bless you tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I'm the youngest of six, four boys, two girls. And there was two sisters older than me that would not let me do anything. If I went to, let's say, vacuum, they'd come and vacuum over me because it was never good enough. So pretty much that taught me to be lazy. But glory to God, the triune God. I just want to share something with you guys. Because of my trials, I've been forced to do stuff that I never did, that I took for granted, that I took advantage of. I now have to go, you know, I had to go get, let's say, licensing, and I had to go get my own apartment. I had to, stuff that I didn't do because I had others do it for me. So God is forcing me to grow up and become a man and do stuff for myself. So praise the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, that even this, this trial, God is using it to refine me, to sanctify me, to purify me, to stand on my feet, trusting the grace of the Holy Spirit to guide me, to glorify Jesus Christ. Daniel A., when you say leave the Islamic debates, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? So far, Protestant, don't curse us by the grace of Jesus Christ. So I followed your advice, fellas. Why would I quit? I don't. Is this my brother, Daniel Amos? My brother from a different mother, like my mother, Daniel. A? Is that you, bro? They say our love don't pay the rent. No, that's all right. Romania. Why? Why would you say I left the Islamic debates? You mean do I talk about Islam? Yes, I do. Are you saying? Have I stopped debating Muslims? No, I haven't. Muslims don't want to debate me. Right? Thank you, Ron. Could you also cook for me, bro? Right. Like 90%. Prase o ponos. All right. We love you, Father. We love you, Father. We love you, Father. We ask that you give us the power to love you more perfectly and love you more passionately and love you unconditionally and we love the lord jesus your son we love jesus christ our lord your heart that became flesh your beloved son help us to love the lord jesus more passionately more perfectly more com completely and we are in love with your holy spirit we love your holy spirit we're in love with your holy spirit we depend on your holy spirit and again help us to love the holy spirit more perfectly more passionately and more completely we need you father we need you, Lord Jesus. We need. Yeah, I told you it's going to buffer, but in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the buffering doesn't last as long. So we love you. Bring in it, Lord. Please, Lord. Yeah, I'll follow the Spirit in Jesus' name. All right. Yeah, I'll follow the Spirit. Okay, amen. In Jesus' name. Father, Son, Spirit. Lord, if you're pleased, strengthen the internet connection. Please, Father, because everything good. Is from your spirits. Bind them up by the holy blood of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, bless the connection, Father. Father, strengthen me by your spirit. Fill my chest and lungs and throat with the breath of life, the health I need. Grant us the grace of holiness to be holy and pure and righteous in your sight. Crucify our flesh. Mortify our flesh. Save us from the flesh and the stains of the flesh. And save us from Satan and his influence and his children and this world, Father. In Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, washing us, the Holy Spirit sealing us, Father. And Father, anoint my words to speak truth without error, to speak it clearly. And to bless your people. Fill us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your Holy Spirit. And have your way with this session. And please strengthen the internet connection, Father. We need you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. As I told you, it's going to buffer, but hopefully the buffering won't be as long. I've done everything I could, folks. I'm now connected to the modem and the, route, the router. I even changed the DNS. I don't know what to tell you. Okay? Hopefully it's going to get better and better and better, right? So we're going to trust by the grace of God that this session will be clear. And by the way, the speed test, the download was around 330 last time I checked, and the upload was 31. So let's see. By the way, is Protestant here or he, he's not here? What happened? 
I thought I saw him. Oh, he's here. Okay, good. So Protestant, I've done everything I can now. Connected to the modem router with the Ethernet, right? Change the DNS. We'll see. Yeah, it did lag. Don't step away, Radical. Maybe it's your presence. Okay, so now let's continue discussing the Gospel of John and specific objections that anti-Trinitarians raise from the Gospel of John to refute the Trinity and the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Love you too, Daniel. Okay, everyone ready? I want to finish the series on refuting the misinterpretation, misapplication of specific verses in the Gospel of John that anti-Trinitarian heretics, agents of the devil use, to refute the Trinity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because these come up all the time. And guys, again, guys, if you go to the website answeringislam.net, check out individual authors. I got two links, one to the newer format and one to the older format. You'll find over 100 articles defending the core doctrines of the Christian faith and exposing Islam. Study those materials because I've addressed all these objections in those articles by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Since I've been doing full-time ministry in 1999, by the grace of God's spirit, I've devoted myself entirely from 1999 because at that time there was no YouTube. So everything was written responses. And go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Do a search for any topic. It's there, I promise you. And also read Anthony Rogers' materials on answeringislam.net. He's got his own link too. And on answeringmuslims.com. I promise you, if you study the materials, you will have ample evidence to refute every major attack against the core doctrines of the Christian faith. The Trinity, Jesus is the God-man, the Holy Spirit is a person, the authority and inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, and so forth. I promise you, I'm not making it up, right? And also, if you go through my archive sessions, I've been doing this for about two years. If you start from the very first YouTube session and start listening all of these objections have been answered over and over again, repeatedly, thoroughly by the grace of God's spirit. Make use of it. And I forgot this link right here. Okay. I just posted this two days ago. Did you know that Muhammad had a white devil? And this is for you students of Islam. Who witnessed the Muslims and debate the apologists. Did you know that? Muhammad had a white devil. See, Anna growing. God bless you, sister. The Lord Jesus strengthen you and fill you. All right, and seal you in Jesus' name. And if it's the desire of your heart, may the Lord Jesus open a door that you find a godly man sold out for Jesus, in love with Jesus, to lead you in Jesus' name, if that's what you desire. Some people are called to uh, singleness, right? I know one in particular says that God has put in her heart to be single. Oh, well. Right? Now, let me clip, post the link again. Here's the link. Okay. Let me repeat again. Did you know that Muhammad had a white devil? Did you guys know that? Okay, now what do I mean by white devil? You guys must read that article. Click on the link, save it, study it, and use it. According to the Muslim sources, guys, I want you to pay attention. According to the Muslim sources, man, we were up to 140, 150, one time 160. Come on, we want more. We want over to 100 in Jesus' name. Bring them, Lord, for your glory. Okay. According to the Muslim sources, listen to this. There was a jinn that would appear in the shape of Gabriel and deceive Muhammad into thinking that he was speaking to Gabriel, when in reality it was a devil, a demon, an unclean spirit, who took the appearance, the semblance of Gabriel. His name in Arabic was Al-Abyad. Al-Abyad. You know what Al-Abyad means? The white one. So Muhammad had a white devil, literally. You get it? You understand what I'm saying here? Al-Abyad, the white one. Exactly. The white one. So Muhammad literally had a white devil. A devil, a jinn, a genie that was a devil who is called the white one, who would appear as Gabriel, speaking to Muhammad, Muhammad thinking that's Gabriel inspiring him. So in this article, I bring out the damning implications of this. This is further proof from Muslim sources that Muhammad was demonized. He was demon-possessed. He was under the control of Satan. And Satan duped and deceived him and used him as a pawn from their own sources. Okay. Now let me tell you why this is damaging. 
Let me tell you why. And according to the Muslim sources, according to the Muslim sources, it was this Al-Abiyad, the white one, that inspired Muhammad to recite the satanic verses. The Muslim sources say, he is the devil that inspired Muhammad and duped Muhammad into reciting verses praising the three goddesses, thinking this was revelation from Allah. Okay, now let me bring out why this is damaging before we get into the main topic, the meat. Okay, here's the link again. Okay, here's the link again. Let me tell you why. Once it's admitted that a demon, a devil, an evil spirit could appear as Gabriel and confuse and deceive Muhammad into thinking it's Gabriel, then that means you've destroyed the very foundation of Muhammad's prophethood and the Quran because now you have no <clears throat> solid proof that it wasn't the same devil who appeared as <clears throat> Al-Abiyad and Gabriel in order to throw Muhammad off his scent. What do I mean by that? Once you admit that there was a demon, Al-Abiyad, that appeared as Gabriel, then that means when the so-called real Gabriel showed up, you have no way of proving that wasn't the same devil playing a trick on him. In other words, what better move on the part of the devil to appear as, a, as Gabriel, then appear again as Gabriel, then appear as the true Gabriel and say, hey, Muhammad, that Gabriel, that was a demon. So I'm here to protect you from that demon. Don't trust him. All the while, it was the same devil playing both roles to throw Muhammad off his scent. So these sources destroy the foundation of Islam, prove that Muhammad is a son of Satan, used of the devil, and the Quran is of the devil. Because what better way, what smarter move, right, on the part of the devil to appear to you as Gabriel and saying, I am Gabriel, then appear as Gabriel again, but then this time <clears throat> say, oh, that wasn't Gabriel, that's a genie, that's a jinn an evil spirit, and I'm here to protect you. I'll let you know when it's really me or when it's that jinn showing up, when in reality it's the same evil spirit appearing both times as Gabriel to then <clears throat> disarm Muhammad into trusting him. Oh, okay, so now, you know, I'm safe because the real Gabriel will show up and protect me, right? And do pray for me. Tomorrow I have a big day again. Pray in Jesus' name that in his miraculous grace, love, and compassion and mercy, he shows up miraculously to save me and constrain that evil, wicked demon of Satan in Illinois. Keep me safe and free to serve Jesus Christ. Pray for a miracle so I can be free to serve him, right? So save that article and study it, right? Well, Freddie, some of them say, see, it's a, pro it's a proof, Freddie, that he's a prophet. Because the real Gabriel came and told him that that was a fake Gabriel, a demon. You see? Right? So with that said, let's plunge into the topic. Come on, guys. I'm getting hurt. I'm crying. We're up to about 160. Now we're down to 78. <laughs> I do hit the like button. Okay? They don't, first and last. That's why you need to download the article and study it. It's damaging. Now let's talk about John chapter 10. Are we ready? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the objections used to try to refute that Jesus is God in the flesh, according to the gospel of John, is to misquote, misinterpret, misapply John 10, 34, 36. But we're going to start at John 10, 31 to 33. John 10, 31 to 33. Okay, John 10, 31 to 33. Jesus is my God. Do you want to remain on my channel and you want to benefit from these sessions, brother? Do you see I have a topic, brother? The topic is John's gospel, Jesus and the gods of Psalm 82. Why are you now being disrespectful, disrespecting me by bringing up a question that's not related? Why do you keep repeating the same question over and over again? I saw it the first time, but I ignored it. Because I thought you would see this is not Q&A right now. See, brethren, I don't want to be a stumbling block to you, but don't cause me to stumble. If you want to benefit, follow the rules because I'm trying to maintain order by the grace of God's spirit so you can get the most out of these sessions. So why are you repeating the same thing at least four times? John 10, 31 to 34. 
Brother online English teacher, you're throwing me off. Okay. Usually it's rabbinic Jews, Jews of the rabbinic tradition that abbreviate God's name. Like in English, they'll put G-D or L-D. So I'm really confused because here it's quite obvious you're a Trinitarian and you worship the true God, the triune God, and you worship Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why do you abbreviate God's words, the, the names, the English names of God? Just curious. You throw me off here. G-D, -D, L-D. -D. How you doing, Mike? Don't worry, brother. Who told you that abbreviating the name of God is a form of respect? Because here, let me let me educate you out of love. That means if you follow that understanding, if you follow that understanding, the Greek New Testament must be showing irreverence to God because there is no evidence suggesting that the original autographs, the autographa, meaning the original composition of Mark or Luke, when, when Mark originally wrote his gospel inspiration, they abbreviated the names for God in Greek, such as Theos abbreviating it, Jesus abbreviating it, Holy Spirit abbreviating it. You can't show more respect and reverence to God than the inspired authors of the Bible. If they didn't abbreviate, why would you? This is what I call, and I say this because I'm trying to teach you too out of, out of love, what I call false piety, fake piety. You get my point? You can't be more pious, more spiritual than the inspired authors of the scriptures who were spirit-filled and receiving revelation from the spirit to write God's words, incorporating their personalities and preserved by the Holy Spirit till this day. So you can't be more holier than them. If they didn't abbreviate, why do you abbreviate? Now, it is true that later scribes followed that same custom, but that's a custom that was influenced by Jews, where you'll find... In the Greek manuscripts, the oldest copies of the Greek manuscripts, which are not the original, what they call the nomina uh, sac sacra. Nomina sacra, nomen sacrum. Nomina sacra, sacred names where the divine names or holy names they abbreviated. But that is because you see they're being influenced by Jewish tradition. I'm just sharing that I'd love for you to help you. This is not... The way to show piety. You know, let me tell you the best way to show piety. The best way to show piety is do everything you can by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit to fight sin. It is not pious for us to abbreviate God's name, but then watch porn. And may God save us from that and purify us in Jesus' name. Right? Because I know that's a struggle for, for all of us. It is not piety to abbreviate Jesus' name, but then gossip and slander. It's not piety to abbreviate the name of for the Holy Spirit, the words Holy Spirit, but then cheat, steal, and defraud. You get my point? Everyone understand what I'm saying? True piety in the eyes of God is by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit, crucify the flesh. Don't succumb to it. Lord, help me not to succumb to watch images I shouldn't watch. Help me, Lord. Forgive me when I fail. Help me. <clears throat> to take care of the poor, to take care of the widow, to visit the sick, those in prison, and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, or fasting and praying and singing and studying the word of God. That's true piety. Isaiah 58. Exactly, Mike A.D. And I say, as I share that in love for you, brother. Don't think I'm trying to put you down. I'm just trying to say, don't follow the traditions of the Jews the superstitious practices of the Jews, practices that arose from their gross misinterpretation of the Bible. This practice arose out of their trying to, what they call, putting a fence around the Torah, fencing the Torah, where Exodus 20, verse 7 says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So what they did was they ran with that and added these superstitious practices in order to prevent anyone from getting close to blaspheming or taking God's name in vain. But they overdid it. They overdid it. God didn't say, don't use my name. Don't pronounce my name. Don't write out my name. He says, don't take it in vain. Take it in vain doesn't mean don't spell it out. Right? That's not what it means. 
Is that clear? Now let's go back to John 10, 31, 33. John 10, 31, 33. Yeah, Nehemiah Gordon is a Karaite Jew. Man, these names. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. He's against rabbinic Judaism and tradition. Can I read with me, folks? Focus now. Let's focus by the grace of God. Once again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Jesus replied to them, I displayed to you many fine works from the Father. For which of those works are you stoning me? Now, I don't know why Protestant decided to go to Job Witness Bible. The Jews answered him, we are stoning you not for a fine work, but for blasphemy. For you, although being a man, make yourself a God. You, you've baffled me, Protestant believer. Why the Job Witness Bible today? You put me on shutdown mode. Man. May the Lord Jesus anoint us and fill us with the Spirit to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him, right? Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from the Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? Here, pay attention now. Guys, pay attention. The Jews answered him saying, for good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou, being a man, make thyself God. Now, in the context, if you go listen to the previous sessions, go listen to the previous sessions. I don't want to repeat material that I've already discussed. I want to proceed, go further into the scriptures with greater depth by the power of the Holy Spirit, with greater clarity from the Holy Spirit. So I can't repeat my exegesis of John 10, 27 to 30. So by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I already covered the meat of that section. Go back and listen to the previous session where I discussed this. Here, the Jews correctly understood that Jesus, though being a man, was making himself out to be God. So they're right. He's claiming to be the God man, a true flesh and blood human being, a Jew, but he's also God. But where they were wrong was to assume that he's blaspheming because in the Jewish mind, a man cannot be God. So where were they right? Pay attention. They were right that Jesus was making himself out to be the God man. He is God and he's man, the God man, one person, two natures. They got that. But they thought no man can be God, so they thought he's blaspheming. That's where they were wrong. They were in error in thinking he's blaspheming. But they correctly understood what he was claiming. They were correct that Jesus, being a man, was making himself out to be God. But where they were mistaken was in assuming he can't be God, therefore he's a blasphemer. Everyone there? You understand? Where they were right, where they were wrong. Because remember, everything has to be interpreted in the lens of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, the prologue. Because those verses are the lens that the Holy Spirit has given us to put on to understand John's gospel perfectly. Understand it the way the Holy Spirit wants us to understand it. And the prologue, prologue has already begun as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and grants me clarity of speech and thought to glorify the name of Jesus Christ and bless you as people. The prologue has begun by identifying Jesus as the eternally existing word of the Father who eternally existed as God in essence, who eternally existed in fellowship with God the Father, and who created all things and gives life to all things, who then became flesh. Okay, but now are you ready for the objection? This is an objection that all the anti-Trinitarians raise, whether Jehovah Witness, whether Muslims, whether Unitarians, to this exegesis. Are you ready for their objection? Who's not ready? Are you ready for the meat? And I've already discussed this passage. I even have an article on this passage. Remind me to give you the link to my article where I discuss this. Okay, John 10, 34 to 36. It's Louisa here. She was here. She left, I guess. John 10, 34 to 36. Here's the objection. You mean, if you are serious that you're not understanding, I'll clarify. If you're trying to mock, I'll muzzle you. Why don't you get it? Because you put two. Amens. I hope you're not mocking because I have a field day humiliating you, brother. Okay. John 10, 34, 36. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the father has sanctified. And sent 
into the world. Thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God. Now notice what our Lord Jesus just did. In order to defend himself against the false accusation that he's a blasphemer, he quotes Psalm 82, verse 6. Psalm 82, verse 6. He goes, is it not written in your law? The law that you believe is revealed by God, inspired by God. The law that's in scripture, in scripturated words of God, God's word in, in scripturated, preserved. Is it not written in God's written law, inspired law, written revelation? I say you are God's. Now, what is he quoting? Psalm 82, verse 6. Let's read it. I have said ye are God's. And all of you are children of the Most High. Now, we have to unpack this. If you want to understand why our Lord Jesus Christ appealed to Psalm 82. And what does Psalm 82 mean in its context? We have to look at the entire psalm. If you're serious about going into the scriptures with greater depth, trusting the Holy Spirit to give us meat, then we have to unpack Psalm 82. Who's ready? Anyone ready? Because we got to go to Psalm 82. Who is the psalmist referring to by saying, you are God's sons of the Most High? Okay. And admins, mods, if you see anyone distracting, send them, send them on their merry way. Let's begin Psalm 82, verse 1. Let's unpack it. Psalm 82, verse 1. Okay. Let's unpack it. A psalm of Asaph, God standeth. In the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Now, let me give you a link, a link to the Hebrew. You don't need to re need Hebrew to see the point because it transliterates the Hebrew and English. Okay, here. Let me give you the link. Okay. Let me get it. See, it's a little so okay. Here we go. Psalm 82. Here's the link. Okay, guys, you have someone here who's trolling, trying to plan the sentiments of Christians to steal money so he can finance himself. Okay, here you go. That's the link. Click on it. This is what it literally says. Okay. <clears throat> Elohim takes a stand in the congregation of Il among the Elohim. Okay, so let me spell it out. Elohim takes his stand in the congregation or assembly of Il among the Elohim to judge. Okay, there are two different words used for God in the Hebrew text. Two different Hebrew words used for God. In the Hebrew text. Okay. No, that's not Trinity. You have Elohim who stands. And you have Il. To whom the congregation belongs. And then you have Elohim that are judged. Do you see? There are three groups. Three groups. And thank our brother Abdul Halaj. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a Jewish believer in Jesus. Who reads Hebrew, Aramaic. Right? And Arabic. And he's confirming what I'm telling you, okay? So you have someone who speaks Hebrew, reads Hebrew, who's confirming what I'm saying. Did you click on the link and see? It says, Elohim takes a stand in the congregation of Il. Il, that's the word God in Hebrew, it's singular. To judge among the Elohim. There are three groups and two words for God in Hebrew. The two words for God in Hebrew are Il and Elohim. What's amazing, brother? The Bible is amazing, and the God of the Bible, Shayun, is amazing. Because he is the definition of amazing. Okay. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? You understand? There are three different groups. Nikki, where are you, sister? I have done dozens of sessions on why he doesn't know the dear hour. I just did one recently, and I have dozens of articles. Stop. Guys, before you ask me to answer objection, stop asking me that. Search the YouTube channel, see if I've addressed it, or the websites, see if I've written on it. 
Okay, but everyone who's following me, pay attention, folks. Please, I don't want to lose you. If you're getting confused, I can't move on, right? Because I want to make sure you're getting it by the grace of God's Spirit. Three groups and two words for God in Hebrew. Il, which is singular, singular in Elohim. So you have an Elohim who's in the congregation of Il, Il meaning God. And this Elohim is judging other Elohim. Everyone getting it? Okay, so it's saying there is a specific Elohim, one particular Elohim, one God. He's in the congregation of Il, the congregation of God. And this Elohim, this one, is going to judge the rest of the Elohim, the other gods. So now here's the question. Freddie, why aren't, what are you not getting, brother? Why, what are you not getting? Yes, Elohim is plural for God. So it can mean gods or it can refer to the one true God. And this is why when it refers to the one true God, Captain Ron, it's always translated as God in English. Taylor, what about it? Taylor, brother, you're going to kill me now. Why are you asking me about the word Yahweh when it's not used in the psalm? Why would I mention the word Yahweh or Yahovah when that has nothing to do with the psalm and the words that the psalmist is using by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What about the word Yahweh or Yahovah or Jehovah or yod Hey vav Hey, the Tetragrammaton? What about it? For, guys, this is where ask the Holy Spirit to give us the control and the discipline to learn to focus and meditate because we're all over the map again. What does the name Yahweh have to do with the names used in this psalm? You, you, you with me there? I'm addressing the psalm. The psalm doesn't use the Tetragrammaton. The four consonants, Yod, He, Vav, He. It doesn't use Yahovah or Yahweh. So why would I mention it? Right? So can we focus? What words does the psalmist use for God? Il, E-L, Elohim. So why mention Yahweh or Adonai or Adonim or Adonenu or... Right, he doesn't mention those words. Okay, so did you get the first verse, guys? You're getting meat here by the power of the Holy Spirit. Give him glory for raising up teachers and equipping them to bless you with the depth of scripture for the glory of Jesus. Right, because I'm sure many of you are not getting this in your churches and from your pastors. Right, okay, so three groups. There's an Elohim, one specific Elohim. He's standing in the congregation of Il. This congregation belongs to someone called Il, which is the word for God. So it's a congregation of God. And this one Elohim is judging other Elohim. Okay, now, so now my question is, my question is, why is this one Elohim judging these Elohim? Why is this one called God judging the gods? Why are these gods being judged? Here's the answer. Are you ready for the answer now? Are you ready for the answer? Why is this one Elohim, this one particular Elohim, judging the other Elohim, the other gods? TJ, that's why we are addressing Psalm 82. Because TJ, in John 10, 34, our Lord Jesus Christ is quoting what Psalm? Were you here from the beginning to here? Why am I on Psalm 82? Why even... Mention Psalm 82. Why even interpret Psalm 82? TJ, were you here from the beginning to here? Okay. So, brother, go back to the start. Listen from the start because I address it so I don't have to repeat it again. Okay. So let's see why this one Elohim is going to judge the Elohim, the gods. Let's pick it up from verses 2 to 5. Psalm 82, verses 2 to 5. Exactly, Freddie. You got it now, Freddie. God bless you, brother. May the Holy Spirit continue to illuminate you. Here's why these gods are going to be destroyed and judged. How long will ye judge unjustly? See, they're corrupt. They're unjust. They're wicked. Like that judge in Illinois. May the Lord Jesus, the true Elohim, arise against her, silence her, chasten her like the dog she is in Jesus' name. Right? 
How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Salah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. That's what you were supposed to do. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. But instead, notice what they do. They know not. Neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Why are these gods being destroyed? Why are these gods being punished? Why are these gods being <clears throat> judged? Because they are corrupt, evil, wicked, unjust rulers who instead of taking care of the poor, the needy, the widow, who instead of fighting for the cause of the righteous, the marginalized, they are spreading corruption. They are spreading evil. They are emboldening the wicked and helping the unjust to prosper. Like that wolf, wolf, wicked, filthy dog in Illinois, that wicked judge, may the Lord Jesus silence her. And I'm just speaking the truth. So God is now upset. God is now fed up. God is now going to destroy them. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. You get it now? So now let's read Psalm 82, 6 and 7. Psalm 82, 6 and 7. I have said ye are gods, all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now let me explain to you what that word men is. It's actually the word Adam. It's actually in Hebrew the word Adam. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Check it out for yourself. Literally, it says, you shall all die like Adam. Ke Adam. Ke Adam. Oh, sorry. I gave you verse 6. I'm sorry. Hold on. And Abdul Halaj, can you confirm? And here, they can read it in English. Ke Adam. Ke Adam. There you go. Tamutun. Yeah, Tamutun. Like Adam, you will die. Right? So literally, you can translate it not as you will die like men. You will die like Adam died. Are you with me there? You will die like Adam died. Like Adam, who corrupted himself and died, though he was in the image of God, and is crowned by God to be the ruler of the earth, you too will die like Adam did, because you are corrupting yourselves as well. Everyone with me there? You understand what the psalmist is saying? Is it making sense or no? Is it, is it sinking in? I may not be as entertaining, but I'm trying to be educational to help you plumb the depths of Scripture to see how deep Scripture is, how beautiful Scripture is. It's truly the, the wisdom of God, the Word of God, the revelation of God. Okay? Luis, I'm going to get there. Just be patient. Okay. So what's the point of the psalmist? The psalmist is saying, these gods are the rulers of the world. They were commissioned to rule the world righteously, justly. Instead, they turn out to be evil, wicked, corrupt rulers, oppressing the righteous, neglecting the needs of the poor and the needy, emboldening the wicked, and being partial to the unjust and, and sinners because they themselves are wicked and unjust. <clears throat> So now God says, enough. Though you were called to rule, I'm now going to kill you dead. I'm going to strike you dead. I'm going to punish you. You're going to die like Adam did. You're going to be removed from the earth. So then who's going to rule? Psalm 82, verse 8. Psalm 82, verse 8. Who's going to rule then? God, who's going to rule? Psalm 82, verse 8. Masori, don't ask me what Adam I just explained it a few minutes ago. Brother, you're hurting me because I explained, and you're asking me what, Adam? So are you listening? Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all the nations. God is now going to rule. God is going to reclaim the nations. God is going to judge the earth. So the nations that were entrusted to these gods, these gods will be removed. They'll be struck dead. They'll be killed justly because they're wicked and God is now going to reclaim ownership over the nations and he's going to rule the nations justly righteously and perfectly 
You with me there? You understand what it's saying? I'm fed up. I'm fed up with the evil rulers. I'm fed up with the unjust rulers. I'm sick of their wickedness and evil, corrupting the earth, oppressing the righteous, the poor, the widow, the humble, and emboldening the wicked, the immoral, to prosper. Sure sounds like the world today in America, right? you got corrupt judges, corrupt lawyers, corrupt legal system, emboldening baby murderers, those who murder un unborn children, emboldening the sexually immoral, adulterers and adulteresses, right? Emboldening homosexuality, the LBGTQ, as well as transgenders, and then punishing the righteous, punishing those who want to fear God, love God, and obey God, and believe the Bible is his word. What has changed? What's changed? Nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. But what the psalmist is telling you, rest assured, take it to heart, do not faint, have no doubt. The true God, the almighty God, who is infinitely pure and righteous and just, infinitely compassionate, loving, gracious, and merciful, will arise and destroy all these rulers, remove them from his presence, banish them to everlasting destruction, reclaim the earth and transform it, and he will rule it in righteousness. That's the promise of the psalmist. You with me there? Okay, let me add some more points. We're going to have fun with Psalm 82. I'm not rushing to finish it. Okay, I want you to uh, once again go here to the link, Maranatha, sooner than later. Go here to the link. Pay attention. It says Elohim stands in the congregation of Eel. Okay, Elohim stands in the congregation of Eel. Okay. When you do that, then I want you to look at Psalm 82, verse 8 again. I'm sorry, I didn't give you Psalm 82, verse 8, the, the link. Quote Psalm 82, verse 8 one more time. We looked at it in English, but we didn't look at it in Hebrew. Okay. Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit the nations. Now, folks, click on this link. You'll see when it says, Arise, O God, it's Elohim. Kuma, Elohim. Shapata, right? Haaretz. Did you catch it? Psalm 82 1 says, Elohim stands in the congregation of Il. And that same Elohim who will judge the gods will arise and inherit the nations. Are you with me here? Because now you're going to get blown away. Now you're going to see what the New Testament does with Psalm 82, what our Lord Jesus and his inspired apostles do with Psalm 82. Okay, but did you catch it? Psalm 82, 1, Elohim stands in the congregation of Il. This congregation belongs to Il, to God, but his name is Il. So this Elohim is standing in the congregation of Il. That same Elohim is the one who's going to destroy the other gods because they're corrupt and evil. And that same Elohim will arise to judge them and possess the nations, inherit the nations. Okay, if you're with me, this is a passage that points to the Trinity. In that, it shows two divine persons. There are two divine persons. The Elohim, the God, and the Il, whose congregation it is. So you have two divine persons here, Il and Elohim. So this Il is the owner of the congregation. This Elohim does the judging in the congregation of Eel. Okay, you with me so far? And that Elohim who does the judges, the judging, who judges the false gods, he will inherit the nations. He will inherit the nations. Go to John 5, 22. John 5, 22.
Watch here. Let's see if you're going to catch her. John 5, 22. Get ready to be blown away, folks. That's why we need about 900 people watching. Uh, hardly breaking under 50. <laughs> okay, John 5, 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, is speaking. The Father judges no one. I do all the judging. I judge everyone, and I judge every human being. Hmm. But who is Jesus? John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So Jesus is with God, God the Father, and he is God. So which person of God does all the judging? The Son. So Jesus is the Son who is God, who judges on behalf of God the Father. Hmm. Interesting. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Watch here. Watch where I'm going to go with this. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Wow! Jesus is the Son of God, who is God in nature, who judges everyone and is the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And God the Father used his Son, the Lord Jesus, who is God, to create everything. Now Psalm 45, 6. I'm sorry. Hebrews 1, 8, which quotes Psalm 45, verse 6. Hebrews 1, 8, chapter 1, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Did you catch it? God the Father says to the Lord Jesus Christ, You, my Son, are the God who rules forever in righteousness and justice. Now Hebrews 1, 9. Hebrews 1, 9. Jesus is the God who rules forever on his throne. And he rules forever in righteousness and justice. Hebrews 1, 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, lawlessness. You hate lawlessness. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hmm, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. You have someone called Elohim. He's standing in the congregation that belongs to someone called Ian. So there are two distinct entities here. And this Elohim is going to punish and judge and destroy these gods, these other Elohim, because he hates wickedness, he hates lawlessness, he hates unrighteousness, and these gods are wicked, unrighteous, and evil. So he's going to wipe them out. And this Elohim will arise to judge the earth and inherit all the nations. And then we come to the New Testament. Jesus is the Son of God the Father, who judges all, all things, judges everyone, who is the heir of all things, and he judges on behalf of the Father. And he is the God who rules forever. Do you understand what Psalm 82 is all about? It's about Jesus standing in the congregation of his Father to judge the unjust evil rulers and destroy them and kill them dead. And then Jesus will arise to inherit the nations and rule them in righteousness. You understand? Psalm 82 is a passage pointing to the multi-personality of God. That God is multi-personal. That the one true God is not one divine person. He's more than one div divine person. So in Psalm 82, you have at least two divine persons of the Godhead. Everyone got it? But you guys want to hear something amazing? I wrote an article on this. Did you know that the Jews, whom some believe were the Essenes, that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jews who lived in the Dead Sea, away from Jerusalem and the temple because they thought it was corrupted, who produ produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran caves, right? Did you know there's a scroll? There's a scroll found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, called 11Q Melchizedek Scroll. 
11 Q Melchizedek scroll. What does that mean? It means it was found in cave 11 of Qumran, the Qumran caves. Cave 11, this scroll was found. It's called 11 Q Melchizedek scroll. Okay, number 11 Q Melchizedek scroll. Why is it called 11 Q? Because it was found in cave 11 in Qumran, the 11th cave. This scroll was found. You guys want to be blown away? I wrote an article on this. Let me give you the link. Let me give you the link. You want to be blown away? Jews who are not Christians. Jews who are not Christians. We're not influenced by the New Testament. In this scroll about Melchizedek, you know what these Jews did with Psalm 82? Whoever composed this scroll, if it was one Jew or a group of them, you know how they interpret Psalm 82? Guys, are you ready? I don't know if you, you guys are really paying attention. And it's in that article. Let me give you the link again. Click on it and save it. Lord willing, later we'll have it in the description box. Send. Okay. Yeah, feed them and listen. You can still listen. It'll be on. Okay. Guess what the Jews did with Psalm 82? You know what they said? You know that Elohim who's standing in the congregation of Eel to judge the gods? They said that was Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the Elohim who stands in the congregation of Yahovah to judge the other gods. And you know, according to them, who the other gods were that Melchizedek judges? Satan and his spirit <clears throat> angels. Let me give you the link again. Don't take my word for it. Belial. They go, this is referring to Melchizedek judging Belial and his wicked evil angels and destroying them. In other words, these Jews believe Melchizedek wasn't a human creature, but a heavenly divine being called Elohim who judged on behalf of Yahweh and ruled over the righteous angels who makes atonement for the human servants of God. It even says he returns back to heaven, meaning he's not of the earth, he's of heaven. No, Lopez, there is a debate whether 2 Corinthians 4, 4 is about the devil. Please don't bring that up because I don't I can't go into a side talk. Yeah, just let's let's focus. Are you with me there? You understand what I just told you? Jews who are not Christians. The Jews who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls took Psalm 82 verse 1 and said, the Elohim is Melchizedek. The congregation of Eel, that's Yahweh's congregation, Yahovah. This Melchizedek is the Elohim who judges the other Elohim. And who are the Elohim? Belial, this evil, wicked spirit that we call the devil, and his wicked angels. That means even the Jews understood that there were multiple divine powers of heaven. Yahweh, Yahovah, and Melchizedek. So they didn't view Melchizedek as a human figure, a human creature, but as a divine being who was human, or at least a human being who became divine at his exaltation to heaven. Now you see why Hebrews mentions Melchizedek. He does so for two reasons. One, to show that Jesus' priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, and secondly, to refute those Jews who thought Melchizedek was a divine being because Hebrews is a polemic against them, saying, no, no, he's not divine. Jesus is divine. Melchizedek is only a picture of him. Yes, you can. It works perfectly. Guys, is it opening the link? Copy and paste it. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Okay, folks, you understand the New Testament is not misinterpreting the Old Testament. The inspired New Testament writers are not seeing things in the Old Testament that are not there because you have even Jews who are not Trinitarians, who are not Christians, seeing the same thing. The Jews that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls read Psalm 82 verse 1, and when they read Elohim in the congregation of Eel, they go, oh, this Elohim is distinct from that Eel. This Elohim is Melchizedek, and that Eel is Yahweh, Yahovah 
who Melchizedek stands for and represents. You with me there? Yeah, you may be in a Muslim country that's blocked it. So use what they call, what do they call it? A proxy. Folks, is it sinking in or no? A proxy server. Melki means king, my king. Sadek, righteousness, my king of righteousness or the king of righteousness. Okay, everyone clear? What do you think, Lopez? How many persons in the Godhead do you have? You have four? Lopez, you're scaring me. You're sounding like a heretic now. Because if you're going to say Hebrews 7.3 is literal, it has no beginning, no ending, you have now four persons of the Godhead, or you're going to have to say the Holy Spirit is Melchizedek in human manifestation. So you're scaring me, Lopez. I'm going to have to come lay hands on you, bro. Even though you you look like a big guy who can lay me out. It's okay. Hit and run. All right, everyone with me here? No, MNs, it's not talking about his priesthood. MNs, no, it's not. See, guys, see what happens when you start pontificating and chiming in? No, it's not talking about his priesthood because MNs, according to your view, that means he's now a priest in heaven alongside of Jesus. But Hebrews says there's only one high priest in heaven, it's Jesus. There's not a second. No, it's not talking about his priesthood. Not Melchizedek's priesthood. Let me give you my article on Melchizedek, what it means in Hebrews 7.3. Guys, when I tell you all these objections and questions have been answered on our websites or in my YouTube session, I'm not lying. Here you go. Let me give you a link to the older format. There's two links on answeringislam.net to my articles, the older format and the new format. If you go through there, you're going to see too many articles that you won't be able to read in your lifetime. Okay, here, guys, click on it. You'll see... That I address the issue of Melchizedek. Here it goes. Here. Doesn't the Bible present Melchizedek as possessing divine attributes? And this is a full exposition of Hebrews 7.3. Okay. Full exposition of Hebrews 7.3. Guy, did you say something, brother, earlier? That we're ignoring you? I hope we're not offending you unnecessarily. Okay. Hebrews 7.3 is a polemic against those Jews that thought Melchizedek is a divine being. Because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we now better understand the context of the New Testament. Now we see why Hebrews mentions Melchizedek. He mentions Melchizedek for two reasons. Okay, One is to show that Jesus is not a priest in the line of Aaron because he's not a Levite. He's a Judean. He's from the line of David. He says that in Hebrews 7.14. But secondly, to show that Melchizedek is not a divine being, contrary to the Jews of his day. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls shows, there were Jews who thought he was divine. He's saying, no, Melchizedek is a picture of the one who's truly divine, Jesus. Jesus is that Elohim, that God, which Melchizedek is a picture of. Melchizedek isn't divine, Jesus is. Because Melchizedek is simply a shadow of the reality. That reality is Jesus. Are you with me there? That's what he's saying. Here's the, now the link to the second link to the new format where my other articles are on answeringislam.net. Here you go. Save these. Okay, so under, everyone understand, before I move on, are you getting the fact that non-Christian Jews during the time of Christ Interpret Psalm 82 verse 1 as referring to two divine figures. Melchizedek, the Elohim, who judges the other gods, and the congregation of Il, Il being Jehovah. In other words, this is what they're saying. In Jehovah's heavenly council, heavenly congregation, you have a group of divine beings, spiritual beings. The most prominent of whom is Melchizedek. This Melchizedek is a divine being a second divine power subject to Jehovah, and he is the one 
who judges on behalf of Jehovah, and he's going to judge the other gods, meaning Satan and his angels, because they're wicked, and he's going to destroy them. Exactly, Lopez. It doesn't. Everyone getting it? Before I move on? Glory to Jesus Christ. The connection is now perfect. Thank all you brothers and sisters for your advice. Praise his name. Emmons. Emmons. How many high priests in heaven, Emmons? How many high priests serving in the tabernacle on God's mercy seat? Mike, I got the Ethernet connection going because it came with the box, and I changed the DNS. Emmons, but now using your logic, if Melchizedek is an eternal priest, that means there has to be two because where is he officiating as a priest, Emmons? And I just gave you a link to my article that explains it. Where is Melchizedek officiating as a priest? He's not on earth. So he's saying he's a high priest with Jesus in heaven. That means there are two high priests. Yeah, I'm going to block myself for saying Ethernet. So if there's only one high priest in heaven, Jesus, how can Melchizedek literally be an eternal priest? Freddie, I'm going to hang myself. Hold on. Where are my shoestrings? Where are my shoestrings? Okay. No, Lopez, about 10,000 people told me Ethernet. So when you came, I was so tired of Ethernet, I wanted to hang myself with my shoestrings. That's why I said I was going to block anyone who said it because you came at the end. 9,999 people before you kept saying Ethernet, Ethernet, as if I knew what I was. And I was going to kill myself because I started dreaming even the word Ethernet. I was dreaming and Ethernet came to life, manifested in human form, looked like Muhammad, and I wanted to kill myself in my dream. Okay. Freddie, brother, can I ask you again, could you go back and read my articles? Thank you, Nada Sister, and my rebuttals, and go watch my previous sessions on my YouTube channel, because I promise you, brother, I addressed Elohim. Elohim is a plural, but it can be used for singular subjects or plural subjects. When used of the true God, it's God. When used of multiple gods, it's translated gods. That's how the Hebrew language works. Okay. Everyone following with me? You see why I'm going to have to do a part two to this session? You see why I'm going to have to do part two to this session? Okay. Did everyone understand that even Jews who are not Christians around the time of Christ understood Psalm 82, verse 1, to refer to two divine persons, Jehovah, whose congregation it was, and Melchizedek as the Elohim who judges the other gods? Good, Mike. They're going to think you're crazy. Okay, did everyone get that? Do you want to get that? And I'll do a session on Hebrews 7 3. What is it? In Melchizedek is eternal. God willing, I'll do it this week. How about that? Will that make you guys happy? I'll take the material from my articles and just make it into a YouTube session. Lord Jesus willing. But I want to make sure you get this point first. Did you get this point first? That even Jews saw two divine figures? So that when the New Testament also says, that Psalm 82 is referring to two divine figures. The New Testament wasn't making stuff up. Because there are other Jews who saw two divine figures. What the New Testament did was correct their misunderstanding of who that other divine figure was. What the New Testament was saying is, it's not Melchizedek. You're right, there are two divine figures. 
But the other divine figure is not Melchizedek. Who is it then? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that flesh and blood Jew that you nailed to the cross. You understand now? You get it now? Everyone got it? Psalm 82 says there's this a divine person who's standing in the congregation of God. So this God is distinct from him. And this divine person is the judge who destroys the wicked gods and inherits the nations and rules the earth. Now, according to the New Testament, this congregation belongs to God the Father. And the one who judges these other gods, who happens to be God, is Jesus Christ, his son. The son, not the father, is the God who judges the gods and destroys them, justly so, because he is the son who is the heir of all things and who then rules the world as a just judge. Let's now again look at the New Testament. Who is the heir of the nations for whom all things were made? Jesus. Who is the judge of all nations? Jesus. So he is the God who stands in the congregation of his father to inherit the nations, to rule the earth as a just judge, and to punish these gods. Let me prove it again. Matthew 28, 18. God bless you too. Matthew 28, 18. Exactly, Cloudy. Matthew 28, 18. Watch here. Yeah, please hit the like button. We have 100 people and it's only 74 likes and three dislikes already. Yeah. Matthew 28, 18. I don't have him a Protestant. I guess he got left behind. He probably fell with the gods. He fell like these princes. Okay, sorry about that. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Did you catch it? All power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Who's now the sovereign ruler? The sovereign king of all creation? To whom all creation is subject to? Me. Now notice Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. And thank you, Jojo Monster. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. You catch it? Because now all creation is subject to me, the entire creation, the heavens and the earth and everything in them, belongs to me, is subject to me, and I'm the ruler of all creation. Now go to all the nations and announce to them their king has come, their ruler now reigns, and they must be subject to him because it all belongs to me. You catch it? Is it making sense now? Mark 12, 6 to 7. Mark 12, 6 to 7, verses 6 to 7. Mark 12, 6 to 7, verse 6 to 7. Glory to Jesus. The internet is perfect now. Having, by the way, Jesus is speaking again. Guys, Jesus is speaking. He's narrating this parable. Notice who Jesus claims to be in the parable. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last, last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and inheritance shall be ours. So Jesus is the beloved son of God. Jesus is the heir of God, meaning whatever God owns, Jesus possesses. It belongs to him. He's the heir. And let's go back to John 5.22 again. John 5.22. Watch here. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Oh, and by the way, not only am I the Son, the heir of all things, who inherits all the nations, for whom all creation belongs, I'm also the judge of all things. I judge everyone. My Father doesn't judge. He lets me judge everyone. Hmm. He's the heir of all things. All nations are his inheritance. He's the just ruler who rules over creation. All in the heavens and the earth belong to him. He has authority over all creation, everything in the heavens and the earth. He judges everyone. What more proof do you need? He is the God of Psalm 82 who judges the, the other gods. Now let's revisit Hebrews 1-2 again. 
Hebrews 1, verse 2 again. Exactly, Nara. Perfectly stated. Christ declares that the authority that is his by intrinsic right, by virtue of being God, he now exercises as the God-man. It's the God-man who now rules. As God, all things are his and he's the sovereign Lord. But now that rule is mediated through his human nature as the God-man. Beautiful. Hebrews 1, 2. Guys, listen to this. Hebrews 1, 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Guys, what else do you want? New Testament says, Jesus is the heir of all things. All authority in heaven and earth is his. Everything in heaven and earth are subject to him, belong to him. He is the heir. And he judges everyone. But according to Psalm 82 verse 1, the Elohim that judges the other Elohim, he is the one who arises to judge the earth and all the nations are his inheritance. So who is the Elohim? that judges the other Elohim, kills them dead for being wicked and evil, who inherits all the nations because he's the judge of all the earth. According to New Testament, who is that? Matthew George, not necessarily. Don't be parroting Michael Heiser. Don't be a Heiserite on me. Who is that Elohim? Jesus, right? So he understands Psalm 82 verse 1. To paraphrase it in light of the New Testament. Here's what it means in light of the New Testament. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ stands in the congregation of his father. To judge the evil rulers and punish them justly and righteously and killing them dead. Because they deserve to die because they're sinners. That's what it says. So now you want me to paraphrase Psalm 82 one more time? Psalm 82 one more time. You ready again? Psalm 82 on, in light of the New Testament. Jesus Christ stands in the congregation of his father to judge the evil rulers. Arise, Lord Jesus, judge the earth and inherit all nations. That's what Psalm 82 is saying. In light of the New Testament. You with me there? That's what it's saying in light of the New Testament. Now, with that said, here's what's ironic. John 10, 34, 36. Exactly, Lopez. John 10, 34 to 36, 33 to 36. John 10, 33, 36. I want to add 33. Okay, right. Read with me. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So you are a man who's God. So he's the God man. Now pay attention. Where they don't catch it. They don't, they don't see what Jesus is doing. They're so blind and oblivious in their sin and rage. They don't understand who's talking to them. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your law, I said ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, Say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God. You know what's ironic? Little did they realize, here is the God of that psalm who has come to save those who believe and pass judgment on those who do not believe. And these are the unrighteous rulers of Israel, the wicked, sinful, stiff-necked rulers of the Jews standing before the one who's appointed to judge them for their unrighteousness and wickedness. And they don't see it. They don't even know who's standing before them. You understand what's happening? You understand what? You understand who's speaking? The God of that psalm who's going to judge evil rulers, he's the one now speaking to these evil rulers who failed to see who's standing before them even though he's given them ample miraculous proof and fulfillment of prophecy, leaving them with no excuse to reject him. Is it sinking in? Because I want, I want it to sink in before I move on. Because who is questioning him? The Jewish rulers. 
And they're condemning him unjustly because they're evil rulers. And isn't it ironic? These evil rulers are standing in the presence of that God, that Elohim, who's been appointed to judge them and condemn them. You got it, Matthew George. You got what you're, you're seeing Psalm 82 being fulfilled in that the God of that Psalm who judges evil rulers is right there in the flesh, passing judgment on them without them realizing it. John 9, 39 to 41. I got to do a part two on this. You know that, right? I got to do a part two on this. Because I can't do one part. You know, it's impossible for me to do, right? John 9, 39 to 41. And Jesus said, for judgment I, can, I am come. And he's talking to the rulers again, the Jewish rulers. For judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see. And they that and that they would see might be made blind. The Jewish rulers, right? Watch. And some of the Pharisees, the Jewish rulers, hmm, which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your, your sin remaineth. Are you catching what's happening? Evil, evil rulers confronting the God of Psalm 82 who's been appointed to judge them and condemn them to death for their unrighteousness. And they don't even see it. They don't even know who it is that's standing before them. Still not convinced? Okay. John 1.1, 1, 1, one more time. You guys are just like, nah, man, come on. All right. You, you skeptics. John 1, verse 1, one more time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in eternity, God existed with this person called the Word. And that Word was God in essence. And John 1, 14 says, the Word became flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, right? And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? Right? That's the word, right? John 1, 14. And then John 1, 1, 9 to 10. John 1, 9 to 10. The true light that cometh into the world to lighten every man. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Okay, now watch here. Jesus is the eternal word who is God that entered the world and became flesh. And he was sent by God into the world. Okay, now let's see if you're going to catch what Jesus said. John 10, 34, 36, one more time. Let's see who's catching it. Let's see who's catching it. Jesus answered them, it is, not, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Now pay, pay attention here. Let's see if you catch it. If he called them gods... Unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I am the Son of God. See, first last caught it. The word of God came to those gods in judgment. And that same word of God is now standing before them in the flesh to judge them. But you guys didn't see it. Unto whom the word of God came... The word of God was sent to judge them. That same word of God is now standing before your eyes judging you and you don't see it. You got it? See? First last, even though you've heard this before in the past, see, we're creatures of petition. We have to hear this over and over again. You see what Jesus just said? Guys, you don't know who I am, do you? Remember that word of God that came to them, judging them? That's me standing in the flesh right before you. How do we know he's that one? John 1, the proglock, told you. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, I don't know why you're focused on the arm of Jehovah. That has nothing to do with my discussion. Because here he's focusing on him as the word. Everyone catching it or no? 
Is it sinking in? I, who's not getting blown away by this? Are you understand what's happening? The word of God came to those gods to judge them. But the word of God has appeared again, this time as a flesh and blood Jew. And now he's judging them for their unbelief. And yet they can't catch it. But you're supposed to catch it. Do you know why? Do you know why you're supposed to catch it? Because John 1 verses 118 the prologue is the lens through which you're supposed to interpret the rest of the gospel. So you're supposed to remember that John already began by telling me Jesus is the word of God that has now come into the world and became flesh. So that John wants you to see that when he said the word of God came to them, he wants you to make the connection with Jesus. Like in the past, Jesus had come to them to judge them. He's now here in the present judging these evil rulers. I want it to sink in before I move in. I mean, move on. I want it to sink in before I move on. So who came to those evil judges in Psalm 82 to pass judgment on them? The word of God. Who is now standing in the flesh passing judgment on these evil rulers? The word of God. Okay, it's sunk in. So let me answer a question. Is Psalm 82 referring to spirit beings called gods? Or is it referring to human rulers called gods because they're supposed to represent God and have been authorized by God to judge? God bless you, Cloudy. You can listen to the rest of it later on. Okay, let me repeat. Is Psalm 82 referring to spirit rulers who are called gods because they were given authority by God to rule the world, but then they corrupted that authority? Or is it referring to human rulers, not the Jews, I said human rulers, whom God has authorized and given permission to rule, but because they're wicked, they've corrupted the world, and now God is going to dispose of them. In the context of John 10, the only interpretation that fits the context is human rulers. Do you know why? In the context of John 10, the only explanation that will make sense and work is if these are human rulers. Can I explain to you why? This is why I say you cannot follow any human teacher, including me, blindly and think everything we say is absolutely right. Because I know there's a lot of people who love Michael Heiser and swear by everything he says, but he's made a lot of mistakes and misinterpretation. And yes, he has. And I hope he hears me. We can dialogue about it. I've written articles on my blog showing where he's wrong. And I'm not the only one. Another renowned Old Testament scholar mentioned Michael Heiser's view of Ezekiel 28. I'll give you the link. And he says, I examined his arguments and found them wanting. Because he said something interesting. He said, Michael Eiser overemphasizes the ancient Near Eastern connection. That's what I've been saying. He's still good. He's a solid Trinitarian evangelical Christian brother who loves the Lord. But he's mistaken like I'm mistaken, like James White is mistaken, like we all make mistakes. So don't swear by any of us and give us undivided allegiance as if everything that comes out of our mouth is the gospel truth. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. He is God. He is perfect in his understanding. He cannot make mistake. Submit to him, yield to him, and ask him to guide you all truth and save you from error. Okay? Now, can I demonstrate to you from the words of Jesus that the human ruler's interpretation is the correct one? You want me to show you from Jesus himself? That Jesus' application of Psalm 82 shows that they must be human rulers in order for what Jesus, for Jesus' argument to hold weight. You ready? John 10, 33 again, all the way to 36. One more time. One more time. Pay attention. What is their accusation? 
You a man claim to be God. John 10, 33, 36. You a man claim to be God. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy because that thou being a man makest thyself God. So Jesus is saying, it is not necessarily blasphemy for a man to claim to be God. You know why? Because even in your psalm, evil rulers are called gods. Now, how could Jesus' appeal to this psalm justify he being a man making himself out to be God if those evil rulers were spirit rulers, not human beings? You understand what he's trying to say? Even your own law that cannot be broken, cannot be falsified because it's the word of God. It's revelation from God. And God's revelation cannot be mistaken. If God's revelation calls human rulers gods, then how dare you accuse me, a man, of being the son of God, one with him? Then you're going to have to condemn the psalmist for calling humans gods. You understand the point? It makes absolutely no sense for Jesus to apply appeal to a psalm about spirit rulers to justify that he, a man, can make himself out to be God. Because all in Jew need to say, wait, 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 wait. That's talking about spirit beings called gods in heaven who represent God. How does that explain away your blasphemy? But if it's human rulers, then Jesus is now... Put them in a corner that they cannot come out of. You know why? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, guy. You, 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 you scholar, you scribe. You've read Psalm 82, right? Yeah. And those rulers, weren't they evil? Yeah. Wicked, corrupt, whom God killed? Yes. And they're humans, right? Yeah. So if evil human rulers, corrupt evil human rulers can be called gods, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I say I'm the son of God, one with him, even though I'm a man, when the miracles I do prove it. How can you level a charge of blasphemy against me, a man, for saying I'm the son of God, went through the world, and one with God in essence, when human rulers who are evil and wicked, contrary to God, are called gods? If I'm blas blaspheming, then the psalmist was blaspheming. You understand? So which interpretation best fits Jesus' polemic and argument? The human ruler's view or the spirit ruler's view? Heiser's view that this is the divine council or that these are human rulers who rule the earth, but because they're wicked, God is now going to dispose them. This is why I say, and I say this with respect and love for the brother, many of his arguments are very weak and very bad. They are, I'm just being honest. Now, don't get me wrong. The Jews who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls did believe, did believe that those rulers were spirit creatures. They believed it was Belial, a name of Satan, and his evil angels. So they did take it as a reference to the Heavenly Council. But they're not inspired. So we have to take what they say and then interpret their views in light of the God-breathed revelation, the inspired scriptures. Right? Because those Jews also thought the God who judges Bilal was Melchizedek. So to them, Melchizedek was a divine being ruling in heaven. Who agrees with them that they're right? Do any of you agree with them that they're right? So where were they wrong in assuming that God who judges the other gods happens to be Melchizedek, and those gods are spirit creatures? But where were they right? They were right in realizing the God who judges is different from the God whose congregation it is. So they're right in seeing two divine persons. They're wrong in their identity, who, who that second divine person was and who the gods were. Am I making sense? Let me repeat. Where were the Jews right in their interpretation of Psalm 82? They were right in seeing two divine persons, two powers in heaven. Where they were wrong is in the identity of that second divine person. It wasn't Melchizedek and their identity of those other gods as spirit rulers. How do I know? Because the New Testament, which is inspired by God, which is the lens that God gives me to interpret all sources written at that time, 
tells me, yes, there are two divine powers. And yes, that Elohim is Jesus, God's son. But the Elohim are human rulers who are evil and corrupt, whom Jesus will then punish and kill dead. Clear? Folks, I am finished with part one of this session. Glory to Jesus Christ. The connection is phenomenal. Praise the triumph God for his grace, mercy, love, and compassion. Lord willing, we're going to do part two tomorrow. And then, Lord willing, Friday, I'll do a discussion on Hebrews 7.3. What does it mean that Melchizedek is eternal? Literally or metaphorically? Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow, part two of this discussion of John 10. And Lord Jesus willing, on Friday, if the Lord wills, we'll do a discussion on Hebrews 7.3. What does it mean for Melchizedek to be eternal? But tomorrow's a big day for me, folks. Tomorrow, as I speak, there's court in Illinois, and I can't be there. I don't live there. I'm in another state. Pray Jesus in his love and mercy arises against that evil, human, corrupt judge. Isn't it ironic? We're discussing Psalm 82, which is a <laughs> psalm about evil human rulers who are abusing their authority, who are judging unrighteously, abusing their power to abuse the righteous. So pray that the God of that psalm who destroys evil doers, Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord, our love, our life, our Savior, will arise for me and my daughters. Lord Jesus, arise for me and my daughters. Silence that wicked, evil demon of a judge. Shame her and silence her and teach her the fear of Jesus and protect me so I can have the freedom to travel and bless me financially to have the support to do this and take care of my girls. For the sake of my girls, Lord Jesus, arise. Pray for a miracle tomorrow, guys. In Jesus' name, that he'll arise and remove her from me completely, that I'm done with her. And convict my daughter's mother to repent and fear Jesus. There's no repentance in her. She's still trying to justify her sin and blame others instead of taking responsibility. The Lord Jesus chasten her to fear him and repent and be saved. And pray in Jesus' name, God removes that man, Martin, Simon Yako, her boyfriend, from their lives. Keep him away, Lord Jesus. My daughters need me and I need them by your grace. Please, guys, pray specifically by name. My daughters need to be delivered from this corruption and this example of evil immorality because they need to be taught better. And pray Jesus saves them from their minds being corrupted. And pray God heals my heart to forgive her if she truly repents. So far, there's no repentance. Still justifying what she did and blaming me. And until she repents, she's going to experience misery, depression, until she falls before the feet of Jesus and says, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I confess, forgive me. And then she'll find mercy and compassion in Jesus' name. Right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yehovah, God in the flesh. The God who judges all evil rulers. The Father's blood is heart. Our Savior, our Lord, our love, our life. Lord Jesus, may you come sooner than later. Maran Athen. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord willing, see you tomorrow with good news, good result out of the courts, and tomorrow on Psalm 82. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys. Don't forget to fast for me for tomorrow, please. I need a miracle.